Right, thanks very much everyone for joining uh, our session. So today we're going to talk about uh, defending the cloud, uh, securing your Microsoft uh, data workloads. So my name um, is William Rathbone. Uh, how do we advance? <laughs> yes. um, and I'm a data and analytics practice manager at uh, Simpson Associates. Uh, and I'm joined today by my colleague, uh, Chris Murray. As well. Um, yeah, hi everyone. I'm uh, Chris Murray. I'm the Chief Security Officer at Simpsons. Um, so, in my role, I look after internal security, but also from a, a customer standpoint, we provide some consultancy services around security and infrastructure, uh, typically on data projects. Thanks, Chris. So, what are we going to talk to you about today? So, today we're going to uh, look at the cloud adoption journey and the opportunities and challenges presented uh, by cloud. Uh, how, how we secure data workloads in the cloud, uh, and also look at some of the example uh, data platform architectures that we use at Simpsons, uh, so specifically platform as a service and software as a service, and what we need to do to secure those workloads, and potentially what we need to do differently to secure those slightly different uh, um, sort of architectures, and obviously finish up with a QA. and a um, it's not all going to be death by PowerPoint. We do have some, some demos as well, so, so, so don't worry. They'll be the ubiquitous demo. Uh, I'll just hand back over to Chris. Thanks, Will. Um, so yeah, so I think uh, when, when uh, I've, I've got another presentation that I've done a similar topic about security on cloud, uh, but primarily talking about Azure and data platforms. But obviously, things are changing in that space as we now we look towards uh, things like Fabric and Power BI, um, and some of those traditional past services have become SaaS services. Um, so I think it's important to understand where the uh, adoption journey for cloud for most organizations began. Um, and it typically started with Azure. Um, it could have started with Microsoft 365 as well, or Office 365, um, a subscription in Azure, and then lots of different workloads, be it PaaS or different SaaS services. Now, cloud presented a great opportunity for organizations because before, faster than ever before, we could innovate, we could deploy resources, we could deploy compute, um, and it was all utility-based pricing. So just like your gas and electric, you only pay for, for what you need and what you use at that point in time. But with those benefits also came a number of different challenges, and those challenges continue to evolve to this day. Um, so with new technologies, um, you, you have to think about different ways of securing those technologies. So tr traditionally, how you would secure on-prem, um, a server on-prem or a database on-prem is not going to be the same necessarily as how you would secure something on Azure or how you would secure Fabric. But it also introduces new attack vectors. And pairing these two things together, it's, there's a lot of additional complexity and additional risk that we have to think about. But if we don't address these risks, um, it can be quite problematic. Um, so these are some examples of breaches that have happened uh, involving different businesses and different cloud platforms. But fundamentally, the issue with these breaches is you know, you know, re reputational damage if we're losing sensitive data, um, also fines as well. Um, so to highlight some of the risks that we face on cloud today, we're going to do a bit of a, a demo. Um, I will certainly try. Might be easier said than done. <laughs> okay. So, does anyone know what a honeypot is? Has anyone ever heard of a honeypot? A few of you. Okay. So, for those of you that don't know, uh, a honeypot is effectively a, a service or collection of services that you would deploy, a security team would deploy in an organization, and it emulates to be other services. So, uh, this one that we're looking at today. It looks like it's a database, it looks like it's a web server, it looks like it's a SQL server, etc. And the idea is it emulates these other services, and if someone connects to it or someone tries to probe it, we're going to see information with regards to where that, where that traffic's coming from, what are they trying to do with it. So it's, it's threat intelligence, effectively. Um, so this is a bit of software that runs, it's running on a virtual machine in Azure currently. Um, and we are going to do, try to do, <laughs> something that you should most definitely never do, which is we're, we're going to open up this virtual machine to the entire internet. So anybody 
can scan this machine, can connect to it. Um, and we'll see throughout the presentation what happens on this VM. So if we allow that. And as you can see at the moment, there's nothing there. It's all quiet. If there were things happening, we'd see it on this list. So let me just jump back to the presentation. OK, so we'll come back to that throughout the, throughout the uh, presentation. So how do we actually secure Microsoft data workloads? Um, I think what we need to think about is when we, when we are thinking about cybersecurity generally and securing resources, it's, we need to think about the high-level processes that we have to undertake to secure not just cloud resources, but any type of resource, be it on-prem, um, on cloud, on SaaS, on PaaS, IaaS, et cetera. Um, so this wheel um, is, is taken from what's called the NIST cybersecurity framework. Um, so NIST is an American standard, and it basically sets out a, a, a large set of controls. But at the top of that are these high-level processes. Um, so we start with identify. And this is the first thing we do with any, or we should do with any sort of project if we're building a new data platform or deploying new resources. We need to think about what are the assets and resources that we're trying to protect. So that could be PaaS resources. It could be SaaS resources. Um, and what are the risks that those assets face? So what are we protecting? Why are we protecting it? And what, what are we protecting it from? What are the risks? We then think about preventative security controls. So how are we going to protect these resources from being attacked? Um, an example of a preventative control could be multi-factor authentication when you sign into your Microsoft account. It could be uh, the antivirus software on your laptop. But what we know is that preventative controls don't work all the time. They fail. They're not 100%. And if they were, I probably wouldn't be stood here today having this, uh, doing this talk with you. Um, so past protect, we then have to start to think about how do we detect threats, suspicious activity that has got past that first phase. It's bypassed our protection. We need to know what's happening beyond that. And it's fair to say from the experience that we have working with customers of all sizes um, that they're often quite good at the identify and protect phase, but detect onwards, they're a bit woolly, um, which is a problem. Beyond detect, once we've, we can detect threats, we then need to be able to respond. So respond could be, uh, we've got a compromised user account. How do we respond and mitigate that threat? We're going to disable the account. We've got a, la a laptop that's infected with malware. We're going to isolate the laptop. We've got a blob storage account that's exposed. We're going to block network access to that storage account. And then worst case scenario, we come on to recover. How do we recover? Well, we might need to restore backups. We not, might need to look at our availability zones if we've deployed something in, in Azure for it to run in a different region, et cetera. And then in the middle of all of this is the governance. And that's where we, we think about setting the direction, strategy, policy. What, how, you know, what's our approach to identifying risks on cloud? What's our approach to protecting cloud resources? So they're the high-level categories. And when you think about cybersecurity, that's exactly what, what we're doing. If someone works in cybersecurity, they are the functions that they should be fulfilling to secure resources. But alongside that, we've then got the shared responsibility model. And as you can see, as we've transitioned from on-premise to IaaS to PaaS to SaaS services, we've, we've transferred away some of that responsibility from, uh, from ourselves to the vendor directly. So we're effectively transferring risk the risk may still exist, but the vendor is responsible for dealing with that risk. And you can see from the transition of on-prem in particular, there was a larger shift of responsibility because we, we had to you know, stop worrying about things such as servers, physical hardware, um, and then from on-prem and IaaS to PaaS, things like operating systems, we don't need to worry about updates, we don't need to worry about uh, making sure the operating system is still supported. So with that in mind, I'm going to hand back over to Will, um, who will look at some example architectures that we work with on, on both Azure and SaaS, so Fabric, et cetera. Thank you, Chris. So data platforms in Azure. Um, so uh, our um, 
at Simpsons, we have a logical architecture called Powerhouse, and uh, Powerhouse is uh, our sort of answer to um, uh, an architecture that has aspects of both data lake and data warehouse. Um, so it's our view that rather than necessarily having to go all down one route or the other, uh, there's some really good aspects of both of these architectures. So this is your sort of standard left to right architecture diagram, data coming in from the left, reporting out on the right. And you'll see that the sort of more big data style workloads, so your sensor uh, and IoT style data, might be high volume, high velocity, uh, high variety, more aligned to data lake, you can go through your data lake. And then your more sort of traditional data associated with business applications, more structured, likely coming from a relational source, you can go through, um, through the bottom of that architecture using your sort of uh, landing staging enterprise presentation as opposed to potentially your medallion architecture within your data lake. Um, so that's obviously a, a, a logical architecture. There's no sort of technology components on that diagram. You know, what would that logical architecture look like in an Azure PaaS uh, setting, for example? So in this diagram, we've sort of added some of the, the components that you might use uh, for, for uh, um, the, the data warehouse. It could be Azure SQL. It could be uh, SignUp's dedicated pools. We've obviously got our SignUp's pipelines. Um, a storage account for our data lake, uh, Power BI on the right-hand side there, um, and uh, you know, um, event hubs or self-hosted -integr self integration runtimes on the left-hand side there. Um, so that's what your sort of typical Azure PaaS architecture might look like. A little sort of prettier diagram uh, is, is what you can see here. Your sort of typical diagram and lots of components uh, of, of the uh, you know, Azure platform uh, placed on, onto that architecture. The, the sort of corollary to that is uh, a, 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 um, Fabric. So obviously Fabric, um, you, you know, we're not going to see the physical architecture of Fabric uh, because it is a SaaS service rather than a PaaS product. So, but nevertheless, we can still map Fabric onto the, the powerhouse architecture at Simpsons. So we've got our, our Spark endpoints for our, our lake house architecture. We've got our SQL endpoints for warehouse uh, and you know, uh, equivalent uh, services giving us the capabilities uh, uh, you know, within Fabric. Um, and similarly, obviously, when we uh, look at the architecture diagram from a fabric perspective, it is effectively a logical diagram. You know, Microsoft's not showing you the underlying uh, components that, that, that uh, are providing the, the, the fabric service. So in terms of, of what sort of, what this changes and the specific sort of fabric security challenges, when it comes to Azure PaaS, you know, best practice implementations are implemented with landing zones secured by sort of Azure policy, so, so guardrails provided by Azure policy. Um, uh, and, uh, but you know, transitioning to Fabric with a SaaS model, that transfers uh, um, many of those responsibilities onto Microsoft as the platform provider. And that obviously has its pros and cons. In the Azure PaaS world, you've got sort of full control of everything. Uh, and you're delegating control in Fabric to Microsoft. And in some areas, for example, uh, as we're aware, private networking, uh, some of the capabilities in Fabric are a little bit uh, less mature at the moment and relatively more costly. Um, but as I hand back to Chris, he'll walk you through some of the uh, responses and how they might vary between the Azure PaaS setting and the uh, Fabric software as a service setting. OK, so back to the question at hand, how do we secure Microsoft data workloads? Um, going, going back to the wheel, the NIST wheel, um, so we've got those security processes that we need to fulfill to make sure that we can secure that platform. Um, but what we need to think about is what are the controls, the different control areas that we're going to embed within those different processes to secure those workloads. So for instance, identification, um, asset management. We need to do asset management to understand what resources we have, what resources we need to protect. Um, so what I've done is, on the left, you can see what's known as the Microsoft Cloud Security Benchmark. Has anyone ever heard of that or used it? No? OK. Um, so the MCSB 
is effectively a set of controls that Microsoft have developed. The intention is, it, it, it's intended for Azure, it's intended for multi-cloud workloads, so it could be AWS, it could be GCP. It's not really intended for SaaS services, but actually, from a control standpoint, they are all the things that you need to do to secure a data platform or a workload, in particular, on cloud. And we often get asked by customers, is our data secure in our data platform? And it's a tricky question to answer because their, their view of their responsibility is a certain section of a platform build or security. But actually, to truly understand whether your data platform is secure, you have to take into account all these other control areas. Um, so what I want to try and do today is give you a high-level understanding of each area, not necessarily in depth. You, you can certainly research the MCSB after this, and there's lots of detail there. It's a huge topic in itself. Um, and I'm sure that some of you in this room may have responsibilities aligned to some of those control areas, but some of them will be absolutely nothing to do with you. Um, but what, this, what you can use this as is a bit of a checklist to think, okay, if we've got a new project to onboard a new service, a new SaaS service, a new PaaS, PaaS service, be it a data platform or something else, you've got a checklist then to think about, have we covered all of these areas to make sure that we've got the appropriate governance, we've got the appropriate security controls in place? Um, and if the responsibility doesn't sit with you, it's likely to sit with someone in your organization. And if it doesn't, there's already a problem because you know then there's a gap. Um, so I've mapped these controls to the NIST cybersecurity framework. So we'll start with the identify phase. Um, I guess it doesn't take any sane really, but if you don't know about something, how can you secure it? And a lot of those news articles that we, we had on the slide before, certainly at least, well, at least one of them, um, the way that that breach took place was because the asset management for that particular storage account hadn't happened. They didn't know about it. The security team wasn't aware of it. They couldn't monitor the security of that storage account, and therefore, they exposed tons of data. So starting point is, what assets do we have? Um, and what are the risks to those assets? And if we think back to our PaaS data platform, um, that PaaS data platform could be made up of a number of different components. So it could be storage accounts, it could be Synapse, it could be SQL, etc. cetera. Um, and we need to have sight of those assets. And how can we do that on Azure? We could do that with something like Defender for Cloud. That's gonna give us a real-time view of those assets and the posture of those assets, which we'll come on to in a second. For Fabric, it's slightly different. So this is where some of that responsibility is transferred. For Fabric, um, you can get a view of capacities, workspaces. You know, you need to understand what Fabric tenants do we have, what capacities, what workspaces, um, for you to be able to manage the risk accordingly. But you also need to understand what about the data, what data resides in each. Asset management isn't just about resources such as laptops, servers, SQL servers, Azure resources. It also revolves around the data. The next two controls, it's st we're still within the identify phase here, but we start to move towards thinking about preventative controls and protection. Um, so the first one being data protection, feeding on from that asset management. How, how do we protect our data? Well, the first thing is to actually discover the data, understand what your data is. Um, I think in the last couple of weeks, Microsoft have actually just released a new free tier on the Microsoft Purview which from what I understand, the, certainly the integration with Fabric and Purview is far better out of the box than it is on Azure, but the Purview free tier works with both PaaS services on Azure and uh, SaaS services such as Fabric. So ultimately, we need to think about what the data is, where it is, where it resides, and then we can move on to think about things such as classification and labeling, but ultimately, this is feeding into that asset management. It's understanding what we've got and what we're trying to protect. Okay, um, so if there's anyone in the room that is responsible for uh, data platform development, um, this is an area that is, is most likely to be where you would get involved with. Um, and this is effectively thinking about, we've got a, a data platform, be it SAS or PaaS. What are the security configurations that we need to apply to that workload? I mean. It's very easy to spin up a resource in Azure in one state or one, one way or another, but if, is it secure? Have you reviewed the different configurations that are available to you to secure that resource? Thinking back to our PaaS example, we've potentially got Synapse, we've potentially got uh, SQL, storage accounts, et cetera. 
the typical way in which we would secure those workloads is with Azure policy or through the deployment of landing zones. So with landing zones, we enforce Azure policy, which is effectively enforcing configuration on those resources that we define. Um, for SaaS, it doesn't change massively. Um, what changes is the scope of those configurations. So for Fabric, just because it's a SaaS service, it doesn't mean you don't need to think about the configuration. There are still things you have to think about configuring. You're just going to do it in a slightly different way. So we define our configurations, and then we start to think about how are we now going to monitor these resources from a posture standpoint. So certainly on PaaS services, again, we can look at Defender for Cloud, and we can look at the secure scores across all of the Microsoft services to understand what's our security posture in real time. Similar for Fabric, there's no, there's no secure score for Fabric. They might be in the future. Um, but there are certainly secure scores that impact Fabric, i.e. your identity secure score. Um, identity being a really key area for securing workloads, be it on, on Azure or on SaaS. Um, fundamentally, if your user account's compromised, you, it's reasonable to assume that you're likely going to end up with a compromised uh, data platform or service that's behind that account. So we can look in a bit more detail at some of the policy. Um, so this is an example. Th these are just settings on Azure, but we can enforce these settings with Azure policy. So we could have a policy that restricts the deployment locations of Synapse. So we might have a geographical requirement that all our data resides in UK South. We can enforce that with a policy. We then might have a, a more specific policy in relation to a service um, where we want to enforce a certain level of encryption. And we do that with Azure policy. But in Fabric, we're still going to do something very similar. It's just the breadth of that policy is, is, is smaller. So there are certain things we can configure. There's just not as much because we've transferred away some of that risk. So for example, encryption on Fabric, it's Microsoft managed, and they will deal with it. There's no real customization there as of yet. Um, but for instance, in this example, we could turn on disaster recovery for a Fabric capacity. So there, is still, there are still configurations and things to think about just not quite as many. Um, now, if we don't get this right, going back to our news articles again, the, the, the consequences, you know, get breaches, exposed sensitive data. Has anyone ever heard of Grey Hat Warfare? So Grey Hat Warfare is a, a partially free, but you can, you can pay for it as well. It's a service that will effectively scan the Azure AWS namespaces looking for exposed public storage accounts. And it will then index all of the files in those storage accounts. Many of those files are OK. They should be public. It might be a, a, an image for a website. It might be a file that you can download on a website. But a lot of those files shouldn't be public. And the reason that that's happening is because they haven't identified their assets and what, what they need to protect. And they haven't thought about the posture. What's the security configuration that we need? What are the risks? Um, are there. Um, you know, you could potentially have a storage account with tons of personal information and financial information, and that could be exposed on this service. I have to say, Chris showed me this website a couple of days ago in the, in the prep for this, uh, uh, this talk, and I was, I was blown away. It literally is like Google for, uh, um, uh, you know, misconfigured uh, Azure resources and, and other cloud provider resources, I should say. <laughs> yeah, it's... Uh, it's, I think the, the problem is people don't realize that these tools necessarily exist. Um, so that they're unaware of the risk. And that's why it's really important to go through that identify stage at the beginning. Um, and going back to our honeypot, as you can see, things have now started to, to come through. So again, if we had a misconfigured cloud resource, we would potentially run the risk of this traffic hitting it. And it might not result in anything, because a lot of this is just sporadic, automated enumeration. They're trying to understand what's, what's, what's on that IP address, what resource is there. Is it a server? Is it an RDP? Uh, is it a you know, remote desktop? Um, if we look on here, where's my cursor? These are some of the usernames and passwords that they've been trying. I mean, these are fairly basic, but as you can imagine, they could keep going and going and going. And if you're not aware that you've got something that's potentially misconfigured, you're exposing yourself to some of these risks, potentially. And can we see, Chris, what, what the, the, the most uh, sort of attacked uh, service is? 
Oh, now you're asking a question. <laughs> um, we might be back on here. Well, we can see there, can't we, that FTP, SSH, Telnet, email, SQL, DNS, I mean, pretty much everything's been uh, got at, hasn't it? Yeah, it's a, total, it's a total mix, but a lot of this traffic is automated, and typically what we see with cyber attacks is that the first stage, the, uh, the initial access stage, is generally automated. If someone gets a foothold in an organization, that's where a human element becomes involved, because fundamentally, it's about making money and monetizing access where they, they get it to systems that they shouldn't. Okay. Um, so we've spoken about identification of risks. We've thought about actually some protection already because we're, we're thinking about baselines and security configuration for services and resources. Um, but we're now well into the protect phase. So thinking about those preventative security controls. Um, endpoint security. Again, this is probably not going to be something that you're responsible for, but if someone asks us the question, how do we secure, is, is our data platform secure? This is actually a fundamental part of that security because you're gonna have clients that you're administering that service with. You might have servers with integration runtimes, on-premise data gateways, et cetera. Um, so think about the, the preventative security controls that you can deploy onto your endpoints, but also the configuration and the, the security of those endpoints as well. Um, so setting a security configuration and enforcing it and reporting on the compliance of those endpoints. And that feeds into, which we'll come on to shortly, is a, a zero trust strategy, which is a bit of a buzzword at the moment, I think it's fair to say, but it, we're moving further towards requiring zero trust as more workloads move into the cloud. So it might not be your responsibility, but certainly look at the controls, and if you have a project where you've got to secure a data platform, it's, it's an area that needs to be thought about. Um, moving on to identity management. So this is arguably the single most important control um, for cloud data workloads. You've got your enter ID, which is your, effectively your sole identity provider. So if we think back to our PaaS and SaaS data platforms, both of those will be configured to use Enter ID to authenticate and authorize users to access that platform. Um, this doesn't change for Fabric or PaaS services. Enter ID is still there, still providing the same function. Um, things that we can do to secure our platform with this is, is su things such as multi-factor authentication, um, conditional access policies. Again, it's, it's about thinking about the configuration of your identity provider. Um, to make sure that access to your environment is secure. Uh, one thing that you could do after this is, if, if, if it's your responsibility or if it's your security team, ask them what's your identity secure score, because every tenant will have an identity secure score. And again, when customers ask us, is our data platform secure? We'll say, well, let's start looking at your secure scores. What's your identity secure score? Um, it's, it's, it's a fundamental part of securing the platform. But it, it, it will also help us move towards that zero trust model as well. Um, and thinking about zero trust and what zero trust actually is. Um, so Microsoft break it down into three principles. They say principle one is assume breach, but effectively we're saying trust nothing, don't trust users, don't trust locations, don't trust networks, don't trust devices. The idea of zero trust is that we take signals from all of these different sources, be it user sign-ins, um, the device that you're signing in from, the compliance status of that device, the network that you're signing in from, the location, the time of signing, all these different signals to evaluate in real time at each authentication attempt whether or not you should be granted access to a, to a particular service. Um, and, and as part of this as well, using the principles of least privilege, so rather than grant you access as a whole to everything at once, this is going to be a, a continual, ongoing assessment of compliance to zero trust. The reason that this is becoming more and more important, though, is because there's been a, a shift in our network perimeter. So as services have moved from on-premise to on-cloud, our perimeter has shifted, whereas before we had our office locations, potentially data centers, we had a, a network boundary there and network security. That boundary is now gone because we've got users working remotely. We've got services on different SaaS platforms, on different cloud platforms. So the new network perimeter is really, it starts with the endpoints, be it an end user device or a server or a cloud service. And that's why this fundamental principle of zero trust 
is more and more important. Just building on from that um, privileged access, uh, building on from identity management, it's just looking at specific controls for privileged access accounts. Don't give yourself administrative privileges on a standard user account for a data platform or a SQL database. Customers often ask why this is the case. Well, if your account is breached, it's generally going to be via an email, a phishing email, or something of that sort. If you're on a standard user account with admin privileges, that's going to immediately elevate the risk of what will happen after that, because they potentially already have access to things at a higher level of privilege. Um, but as far as account separation goes as well, it's if you do things like cyber essentials, it's actually a requirement of the Cyber Essentials Scheme, which is a, a UK government cybersecurity standard. Um, privileged, privileged access, I should, sorry, I should have said, privileged access is also the same across both Fabric and um, PaaS platforms. There's no difference there. It's still the same principles that you need to think about. Um, another area to think about is network security. Still thinking about preventative controls, but effectively what we are doing here is reducing attack surface. So those storage accounts in those news articles were compromised because there was attack surface. They were exposed. Our honeypot is seeing traffic because it's attack surface. It's exposed. There's not the appropriate level of security in place. Um, so there are different things that we can do with PaaS services as opposed to what we can do with Fabric. So PaaS services, we could think about service level firewalls, Azure firewall. We can implement different controls to restrict who can connect to it. Um, but just in the same way with Fabric and PaaS, we can also think about private endpoints and private networking. And that's effectively where we take a, a cloud service and we make it so it can only be accessed from a private network. It can't be accessed over the public internet. So back to those blob storage accounts, if they were configured with private networking and we disabled public access, they wouldn't be exposed. Um, private endpoints, and private link and private networking, it, it provides two real important security benefits. But the first important security benefit really is, is, is the key reason why organizations typically use private endpoints, and that is the attack surface reduction. But the difference between Fabric and our typical PaaS services is that the cost to implement private endpoints is now significantly higher than it was before because it's tied to the SKU that you're using, um, and there's some additional costs that you also have to account for there. But if we think about that, uh, you know, the, the, the benefit of implementing private endpoints, we can still achieve that attack surface reduction on Fabric by thinking about identity management, so implementing things such as conditional access policies. So, to, for example, you can only access Fabric if you come from one of our office locations. So we can still reduce that attack surface somewhat, even without private endpoints. Um, the final protect control area is DevOps. Um, and again, you don't necessarily, you won't necessarily use DevOps as part of your deployments. You might deploy all your Azure resources manually. Um, but it's really important that you secure your DevOps infrastructure. There's a, there's a, a, a major vendor um, who was breached. They had their DevOps infrastructure breached over a, a, a fairly long period of time. And what happened was that the attackers effectively integrated some malicious code into their application, into the code repository. And over, over a sustained period, that code was promoted from dev to test to prod. And once it was in prod, it was then rolled out into production. And that software was then rolled out to their customer base. And subsequently, that software was then used to compromise around seven US government departments. Um, so DevOps, if you're using it, it's really, really important to include within that, uh, with it, within that strategy to secure. OK, so we've identified our assets. We've identified our risks. We know what we're protecting. We've in implemented some preventative security controls. And now we need to start to think about how do we detect threats uh, that bypass those preventative measures. And that's where logging and threat detection comes in. So there are different log sources for the different PaaS services, uh, the different control panes on Azure, and also Fabric. Um, but the key ones for both are identity 
logs, but also audit logs. So you can have audit logs on um, Fabric. You could have audit logs on Synapse. We need to take those logs from these different sources and ingest them into a, ideally a, a seam solution. If you don't use a seam solution, you don't necessarily have to. You could still look at those logs and review them on a regular basis. But the key thing is, if we don't have this information and we don't have this logging, we won't know what's happening. We won't actually know if our environment is, has been breached, if we're not monitoring our logs, um, and we won't know if our preventative security controls have failed. Um, and again, going back to this, the only reason that we can see this in, it, these statistics is because we're generating logs, we're generating information that we can use for security purposes. Okay. So once we've enabled our detection capability, we then need to think about response and recovery. Um, and again, this is the same for both SaaS and, and PaaS platforms. Um, we need to think about the different scenarios that could occur and how we will respond to those scenarios. Um, so for example, it could involve a user account, it could involve a service principle, it could involve a, a particular network. What are the actions that we can take to mitigate attack, uh, an attack? Again, this might not be your responsibility, but for you to secure a data platform or any workload, you need to think about the different scenarios, the different responses that you could take. From the detection phase, we've got those logs, and those logs will turn into alerts and turn into security incidents. So this is about prepping the appropriate individuals, stakeholders, to actually be able to take action on those alerts and those logs. And the final area of the, the technical controls is then backup and recovery. Um, and there are some slight differences here between PaaS services and Fabric and Power BI. Um, so for PaaS services, when we're doing that deployment, we need to think about the regions, availability zones, does the resource support Azure recovery services? Um, not all of them do, Synapse doesn't, storage accounts do. Do you need to back up that data, potentially? For Fabric, it's slightly different because Microsoft take care of some of that responsibility for you, but you, as, as I've shown you, there is the option to enable disaster recovery. Um, and there's also a lot of disaster re recovery documentation out there specific to Fabric, which talks about deployment to different regions, etc. So it, the risk doesn't go away, you just need to address it in a slightly different manner. And finally, that ends on governance and strategy. Um, if you were to go through this with a project from the beginning and think, how are we going to secure a service or how do we actually do security in our organization, this is where you would start. But you need to understand the details of each control area first. Effectively, you need to set the direction and the strategy. So you need your policies, procedures, standards, baselines, guidelines to set the direction. Because it's very difficult, for example, if you're a data platform engineer and there's no policy around how you're going to secure a cloud workload. Uh, it, it's it's more, more often than not that when we work with clients where they've got lots of policies, they've got lots of standards for on-prem, but they haven't adopted those for cloud. Um, and I think a good way to do that is to think about incorporating these different control areas into your policies. It's, it's the, it also, it's, it's the same scenario for both PaaS and SaaS as well. Um, and I think certainly with the Microsoft Cloud Security Benchmark, as I said, it's a, a set of controls mapped to other standards, but these control areas apply across the board. They can apply to Fabric, SaaS workloads, they can apply to PaaS workloads. And that transition from PaaS to SaaS, while there is, a, there is an element of trans, transferring of some of those responsibilities and re reduction of risk and transferring away some of that risk to Microsoft, um, it hasn't changed things massively. We still need to think about all these different security areas. We still need to make sure it's configured in a secure way. So putting this into practice, as I said, these, those control areas are impossible to cover in depth in 50 minutes. There's so much detail into it in each of them, and it's unlikely that you're going to be um, involved in all of them. But think about that NIST wheel, that, that core security functions, uh, cybersecurity functions processes of identify, protect, detect, respond, recover, and, and, and the governance section. 
And you can apply that to your own workloads and think, well, have we identified all of the risks for our data platform? What preventative controls have we got? How are we detecting threats against those different resources or different workloads? And then using the cloud security benchmark and those different control categories, you can almost use that as a bit of a checklist. Um, you know, if you start a new project or if you're involved with a, an in-flight project, to, to go through those areas to understand, have we addressed each of these control areas? Um, it might not be your responsibility, but it might be the responsibility of another stakeholder, and then you can bring them into the project. So use it as a bit of a checklist and use it as a guide. You don't need to know everything that's contained within because I suspect it will be other stakeholders that need to get involved too. Um, and finally, just to finish on just some useful resources, a uh, link to the Microsoft Cloud Security Benchmark, the NIST CSF, a uh, link to the Azure Land is own conceptual architecture, which I mentioned, that's how we typically apply policy and secure Azure workloads, and also the Azure well-architected framework. Um, but that concludes the slides, so if there's any questions, please feel free to ask, but I'll, uh, in the meantime, bring this back up. So the longer that this is online, the more hits it will receive as well. This is just people scanning or computers scanning the address space of the web to find services that are available. And if they find a service, they'll try and attack it, breach it, enumerate what's there. That's showing us in real time, is it, Chris? And we get a, a, an animation that's an actual uh, real time uh, access. Yeah, this is all, re all real time. Access uh, attempt. <laughs> Any questions, thoughts? Yeah, yeah, they, they, they will be available online, yeah. 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 Any other questions? In which case, uh, thank you very much for your thank time. You and obviously, feel free to uh, come up and uh, talk to us uh, at the end. <laughs>